going to do a very, very brief introduction uh, to MFA and to Bob Collins. Uh, if you guys are interested in uh, talks like this, just visit our website. You know, uh, just Google Memphis Free Thought Alliance and go to the meetings. All the meetings that we have are listed on there. And we also meet twice a week, every Wednesday and Saturday at Noob's Cafe in Cordova. Uh, Wednesday is the Occam's group. It's a philosophical discussion group. We try to get a diverse group of people there, uh, including believers and non-believers, to hash out whatever topics we choose. And then Saturday is the book club. Uh, we choose a book, and we just read it and discuss it. So that's MFA. Um, today we have Robert Collins. Bob is has been coming to Memphis, what, for the last three years? Three or four years, yeah. Three or four yeah. years. He's talked about uh, Bible contradictions. He's talked about um, uh, math errors in the Bible. And today he's going to talk about did Jesus rise from the dead. Uh, he's been uh, involved in the Secular Coalition for Alabama, and he's an uh, activist director uh, for that organization. And he's very active in the atheist movement, you know, yeah, particularly in Alabama, but you know, in other places as well. So I just, with that short introduction, I just want to, you know, welcome Bob. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Easter's about to come up, and so a lot of Christians are obviously thinking about their favorite deity rising from the dead. I have had two challenges to debates over the last couple of months from Christians who actually wanted to debate this, which I'm actually going to do. Um, one of them will be available through live internet stream next Wednesday, and I'll send out the, the web address um, if anybody wants to see it. But the, the, the fact is that Christians, they really think they've got us on this one, okay? They think that there's just nothing we can say about Jesus rising from the dead that is going to contradict that. Uh, because the evidence is so strong for it and the evidence against it is so metaphysically non-existent um, that they think they can, they can get us on this. So um, I used to think that the people who defended creationism were the people who were really far out there and were willing to just kind of grasp at straws for anything until I started studying Jesus' resurrection. Uh, the links that Christians will go to to prove that their deity and only their deity ever rose from the dead uh, is just amazing to me. And in fact, uh, that's going to be the topic, topic of my next book. I've done two books, Bible Math Mistakes and False Prophecies in the Bible. And uh, there's not a real definitive guide out there to uh, <clears throat> put all of the information together. There's bits and pieces. But my next book is going to be the definitive guide to debunking Jesus' resurrection. Uh, hopefully that, that will be out sometime in the next year or two. Um, so this, is, this talk is the first of, of several kind of experiments that I'm doing with audiences to review some of this material, to provide you with uh, information, ammunition that you can use uh, to talk to your Christian friends and relatives about the resurrection. <clears throat> the other thing is I want to see how well this stuff works so that uh, I can see whether or not to put it in a book. Does everybody have a handout? Anybody not have a handout? Anybody not have a handout? Okay. Uh, Sheila? Handouts? Okay, well, let's get started. Did Jesus rise from the dead? This is the central question of Christianity. <clears throat> the Bible says that if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is also vain. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So the guts of Christianity is not did Jesus live, is not did the Bible, is the Bible accurate, it's not is Jesus a good teacher or whatever, it is the resurrection. It all hinges on this one fact or historical myth. Uh, I want to talk about, my position is that the entire resurrection story is a myth. I understand that there's different free thinkers and atheists who have different takes on this. But as I studied the evidence, it becomes very clear that this is a myth. <clears throat> there are characteristics of historical events and characteristics of myths that are pretty obvious to most people who really kind of deal with ancient things. Historical events, for example, are provable, or they're at least not disproved by scientific investigation. Myths, however, are not provable by science. They may, in fact, contradict well-established scientific facts. Historical events have written records. Otherwise, they wouldn't be historical. They wouldn't be verifiable historically. 
And these written records are genuine, generally consistent with each other. Now, eyewitnesses are going to differ. If you and I both saw a traffic accident out here in the corner, we would probably have slightly different stories, and that's okay, except for the Bible, which is infallible. But we are going to agree on essential things like places, times, dates, whether or not it actually happened, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas myths have missing records, fraudulent records, records that contradict each other, and so forth. History is supported, or at least not contradicted, by physical and archaeological evidence. There's no archaeological evidence that Caesar was killed on the Ides of March, although we have historical evidence. But there is no archaeological evidence that contradicts it. <clears throat> if we do have some sort of an event that is reported in a source that reports some sort of historical event, and we can prove archaeologically that this guy really, really could not have been anywhere near the event, that is a very negative toward his claim to be an eyewitness. Whereas myths are really not supported by physical and archaeological evidence. There may be some, you know, there's a guy named, a god named Asclepius who healed a lot of people, and a lot of people left little pillars and stuff saying that Asclepius healed them. But, or it may be unsupported. The stories of Heracles, Hercules, you know, nobody ever saw the guy. Uh, so there's no archaeological evidence for that. Uh, Historical events have boundaries. They don't evolve, whereas myths evolve a lot. Myths change a lot. You're going to find a lot of different versions of them. Those who, for historical events, those who study historical evidence tend toward agreement on the major issues about the historical events, whereas those who study the historical evidence for myths will disagree among themselves very substantially, particularly if you're talking about religious myths, or maybe they'll just all agree that it's a myth. The Aeneid, the, Idiot, the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, everybody agrees that's a myth, the people who study it. Um, historical events tend to be different from myths that preceded it. Now, afterwards, there may, be his, there may be myths that would develop, Elvis Presley, for example. But before, <clears throat> uh, a historical example will be different from events that preceded it very often. Whereas myths, the, the similarity to preceding myths is very often very striking and very obvious. So let's talk about some of these things. The first one I'd like to talk about is science. Is Jesus' resurrection supported by scientific facts? Josh McDowell is arguably the most famous apologist, defender of the faith that we have alive today. He claims to have sold over 10 million of a single copy of his book, More Than a Carpenter, and several other books sold more than a million copies, he claims. He makes this statement in his book, The Resurrection Factor, um, and it says, when speaking on the historical aspects of resurrection in a university classroom, I'm constantly confronted with the question, can you prove it scientifically? I immediately reply, no, the scientific method does not apply when researching the factuality of the events surrounding the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Science is unable to investigate it. So Christians are going to want us to, to basically pretend science doesn't exist when we're talking about the resurrection. So I'm not going to waste any time, and I would suggest that other debaters not waste any time talking about whether or not miracles are possible from a scientific point of view. Scientists that are non-theist believe that they are impossible. Christians believe that they're possible. That's the end of the debate. You're going to have a very short debate. But for the purpose of debating, you're going to have to kind of pretend science doesn't exist for a while and attack it from other angles. Now, Josh McDowell's point of view is actually very similar to a point of view that's expressed in the Bible. When the um, Apostle Thomas, and for those of you who didn't go to Sunday school, uh, Jesus was supposedly raised from the dead. Ten of the apostles saw him. Thomas wasn't there at the time. Thomas and the apostles saw him again uh, eight days later. And Thomas says, oh my gosh, I didn't used to believe it, but now I believe it. Jesus said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. Jesus did not say, Tom, you did a great job of evaluating the evidence. He commended, he blessed those who believed without seeing. So let's look at the written records of the resurrection. The only records we have of the resurrection that are, that are widely accepted are the Bible. And of course, they're only accepted by believers. Let's look at the written records of the re resurrection and see if they're consistent with each other. Do they contradict each other? And just as importantly, do they say the same things when they ought to say the same things? 
<clears throat> now, the Christians, the Bible is in a class all by itself. Christians claim that the Bible is infallible. That is, it cannot contain an error. That puts it in a class different from eyewitness accounts, that if you and I witness the same accident, we could slightly contradict each other about whether the car was blue or gray or whether the, the light was yellow or red, uh, but we wouldn't have egregious contradictions or our testimony would not be reliable. The Bible, however, if it's infallible, is, which millions and millions of Christians believe, cannot possibly contain even the slightest error. Now this makes Christians very uncomfortable when you start pointing out contradictions in the Bible, which is one reason why it's really so much fun. <clears throat> this is one example, which is from Campus Crusade for Christ, who's going to be my opponents next Wednesday, uh, of, of a statement of belief about the Bible. And this is very, very common. You'll find it on Baptist websites and some conservative Presbyterian websites, your conservative churches of Christ. The sole basis for our beliefs is the Bible, God's infallible written word, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. It was written without error, inerrant, in the original manuscripts. Of course, there's the, there's the key right there. They don't have the original manuscripts, but it was perfect in the original manuscripts. But we're not going to worry about that because we're here to talk about the resurrection, not textual criticism. So let's look at a couple of statements from the Bible and see how they stack up. Jesus himself predicted, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, that is Jesus, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Of course, the problem with this is that Jesus died on a Friday, which is why they call it Good Friday. I don't know why Christians call it Good Friday. They killed God. Atheists ought to call it Good Friday. But anyway, they call it Good Friday. <clears throat> and He was raised supposedly on Sunday morning. That's only two nights. So even Jesus Himself is off by one. The Apostle Paul said Christ rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and He was seen by Peter and then the twelve. After that He was seen by more than 500 brethren, I don't know what happened to the women, but 500 brethren at once. So supposedly then we have some pretty good eyewitness testimony. Um, it, this doesn't hold up as we look a lot closer though, because for example, Paul said it was twelve, but there were not 12 apostles at the time that Jesus rose from the dead. Those of you that went to Sunday school, who hung himself? <laughs> okay. Wh which apostle was it that hung himself? Judas. Okay. So now we're down to 11. The apostle Paul never mentions Judas. He thought there were 12 apostles at that time. The 11 disciples, when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. Jesus appeared to the 11. He returned to the sepulcher and told these things to the eleven, and the eleven were gathered when Jesus appeared to them in Jerusalem. So there were not twelve. Yes. And they're, they're not saying that one of those disciples was the apostles were the place. It was either Bartholomew, Matthias, or, Matthias. 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 Right. Was that after? That was after this. There's actually no mention of Matthias anywhere in the Gospels. He's mentioned one time in the Book of Acts. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that he is the twelfth apostle. He talks a lot, in fact he spends a lot of time in his letters trying to convince everybody that he's an apostle even though he never saw Jesus in the flesh. So Matthias just kind of, they selected him by, by lot, randomly. He is forgotten. The apostle Paul became the twelfth, twelfth apostle. Um, and that's, that's a pretty common theme you see in the New Testament. That's a good question. That, that comes up a lot. <clears throat> Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Easter story, uh, there were two people that were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and we don't know where Emmaus was, but it was somewhere outside Jerusalem, and Jesus appeared to them. And so they immediately get up and they run back uh, on the day that Jesus was raised, on the first Easter, and they found the eleven gathered there together and told them about it. And then Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. So Luke is very, very clear. The eleven disciples saw Jesus on Easter. John tells it differently. The same day that Easter evening being the first day of the week, Jesus stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. Notice <clears throat> um, Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. And after eight days again his disciples were within some room somewhere and Thomas came, was with them, and then came Jesus and Thomas was convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead. So again um, Luke and John tell a very different story. And John was later, it's kind of a later evolution of the story. So Paul has 12, Matthew and Mark have 11, Luke has 11 saw Jesus at various times. 
Luke says that 11 saw Jesus on Easter. John now, which is a later gospel, says 10 disciples saw Jesus on Easter. And then Thomas saw Jesus for the first time sometime later after the resurrection. He was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Now this is a pretty extraordinary claim. Now notice, first of all, he says brethren. I don't know what happened to the women. Second of all, um, this is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Now that's the argument from si silence. And it is not definitive except for one problem. This is missing from places where they really needed to bring it up. Fifty days after Jesus was raised from the dead, just a very short time after Jesus supposedly ascended from he to heaven, Peter goes and witnesses to a bunch of people in Jerusalem, and he's trying to convince them that Jesus rose from the dead. And so he brings up all this evidence about prophecy and healings and all this kind of stuff. And, but he never brings up the fact, guys, I've got 500 witnesses that saw Jesus just a few weeks ago. Now why would he not bring that up? Peter, sometime later, is defending himself. He's on trial in front of the Sanhedrin, which is sort of the Jewish Supreme Court. Again, he doesn't bring it up. Same thing, they're about to stone Stephen. They're about to kill him, and he's trying to defend himself by saying Jesus really was the Son of God. If it was me and you, we'd bring up everything we could think of. I would certainly bring up a large number of eyewitnesses, never mentioned. Even Paul, who claimed to have, who first made this claim, defended himself three different times before Roman and Jewish authorities, and there's no record of him ever bringing this up. <clears throat> so why would they not bring it up when this is one of the most powerful evidences in favor of the resurrection? The temple veil, this would be unmistakable to Jews. The temple veil, when Jesus died, was torn in two and this is so important to the Christians, it's reported in three out of the four Gospels. But again, they never mentioned it when they were trying to defend themselves and to support the authenticity of Jesus' resurrection. Last and certainly not least, Matthew makes the claim that the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints, that's all Jewish holy people, which slept arose and came out of the graves after the resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now if you were Stephen and they were about to stone you and you were trying to convince them that Jesus rose from the dead and you were in Jerusalem at the time and eight weeks ago or maybe a couple of three months ago a bunch of dead people had arisen and lots and lots of people saw them and you're about to be stoned because you're claiming somebody rose from the dead, would you bring this up? I would. Now maybe Stephen couldn't think on his feet, you know, but not only does Stephen not bring it up, but Peter and Paul and nobody else brings this up. And this is one of those rare events that we would think would be at least reported mythically, if not factually, by somebody who was familiar with Jewish history in the time. Not one single historian, Jewish or pagan or otherwise, reports this event. In fact, it's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Probably the most profound proof in the resurrection that could have been verified by the people. Yes? Uh, how much uh, do we have recorded of that time by Jewish or other historians? Well, I've got the works of Josephus here. But other than him? Um, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. There's plenty, uh, plenty the younger and plenty the elder, a father-son team. One of them actually died in Pompeii in the, in the volcano. Um, they've written quite a bit of history of the first century. Um, I'm going to have to research that, and I'm going to have to get back to you. There is a lot of, of recorded history around Roman Empire and Egypt and so forth. The specific stuff is, is Josephus, and there's a lot of stuff in Josephus about this period of time. Uh, there's probably 50 or 60 pages just a, about Herod the Great. The reason so, I ask is I've heard two different sides of it. One saying, well, it wouldn't be reported because there's just not a whole lot written around that time. And then the other side says, no, there's a whole lot that is written about Palestine at this very time. Well, uh, I think that the historical record is very clear that there was a lot that was written. I think if you would take this book, and um, this is not very precise, obviously, but um, if you would take this book, probably this much of this book was written about Palestine during that time. Oh, I'm talking about, about other authors other than him. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to get back to you on that, and that's something I'm going to have to research when I'm doing my book, so I will get back to you. I just I don't have a good answer for you right now. 
Archaeological evidence. There's not really any archaeological evidence of Jesus, of Jesus being crucified. Now, we can verify that, that they did crucify people back then, but it's, it, there's no more evidence of that than there is evidence that Socrates was made to drink hemlock or that um, uh, Caesar was killed in the Ides of March. There's nothing direct. But we do have one event that would have left enormous amounts of archaeological evidence if it had really happened. That event is reported in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the storm, stone from the door. This was not a little earthquake. This was a great earthquake. Now, earthquakes, as you know, leave enormous amounts of archaeological evidence. This is from Haiti where a lot of the buildings were built out of cinder block and stuff which was unreinforced. Most of Jerusalem was built out of mud brick and stone without mortar which is very, very vulnerable. And so that's kind of why I picked Haiti. <clears throat> but um, earthquakes leave tremendous amounts of archaeological evidence that they occurred. We do not see any evidence whatsoever of a great earthquake in Jerusalem in the span that Jesus was allegedly crucified and raised, in 30 to 33, or, or even, even substantially before or after that. Just none at all. No historical references, no archaeological evidence, none. Zero. Now, I want to give you some idea of the scale of what we're talking about. Jesus is, this is a map of Jerusalem that I downloaded from uh, a, a website. This is actually the part of Memphis where we're sitting right now. Okay, this is the library right here. This is Jerusalem to the same scale. <clears throat> now, if you, if you notice, this is the traffic light right on the corner down here. Okay, if we were, if we were here uh, or here in Jerusalem, we could walk from, from supposedly where Jesus' tomb was, and there's two possible locations, supposedly where Jesus' tomb was, to the scenic gardens or the Highland Community Association as easily, which is just two blocks away, as easily as we could have walked to the Jewish temple. Now, Matthew is claiming there are two possible locations for the tomb. One is called the Garden Tomb and one is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Both of these are very, very close within just a few hundred yards of all of the rest of Jerusalem at the time. Now, there is absolutely no chance that the there could be a major earthquake, a great earthquake occurring in Jerusalem at this time, and the rest of the city suffer no damage. Yet, and Matthew claims it was a great earthquake, and yet it never happened. There's no historical or archaeological evidence for this whatsoever. They just made it up. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the resurrection myth. We've already talked a little bit about the were there 10 or 12 or 11 apostles that saw Jesus on Easter and that kind of thing. Um, for those of you who have never really kind of studied when the Bible was written, um, the New Testament, conservative scholars believe, was written around the range of 50 of the common era to 90 of the common era. Now, liberal Bible scholars will shift that later 20, 30, or more years. But conservatives are going to give you ranges that are about this type of range. And of course, the value to this to them is they're going to say, look, Mark started writing his gospel maybe 50, 55. Jesus raised in, you know, 30 to 33. They tend to claim 33, but there's no real hard historical evidence for that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so there were still eyewitnesses around. There were still people around that if they, if they got it wrong, they could correct them on this. Um, so you have to kind of look at the way that the Bible is evolving this myth to, to sort of deal with that. And remember, Christians believe the Bible is an absolutely perfect book, that it cannot contradict itself. We've gone over this a little bit before. Uh, who saw Jesus after the resurrection? Paul said that there were 500 unidentified brethren. Then the 12 himself but those that were with him at the time never saw Jesus. Um, he doesn't have any dates and times on these things. Now, the Gospel of Mark actually ends with an empty tomb. If you look at the 
oldest manuscripts we have of the Gospel of Mark. It actually ends in verse 9 with the empty tomb. There's verses 10 through 20 were added later. The vast majority of, of Bible scholars do not believe they were part of the original uh, book of Mark. And if you have anybody ask you whether they are, ask them, uh, well, you know, if you, drank any, if you drank poison, would it hurt you? Because there's a thing in Mark 16, verse, I think about 15 or 16, where it says, if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. Well, nobody believes that. I mean, everybody knows that if you drink polluted water, you're going to get cholera or cancer or whatever. <clears throat> but anyway, with Mark, nobody saw the risen Jesus. Now, there was a man at the tomb who said, go to Galilee, you'll see Jesus there. Luke and Acts say that there were two people and then the eleven that saw Jesus on Easter. And then some people saw Jesus sometime later after Easter. Um, Matthew says that women saw Jesus. Now, Paul never mentions that. And then the eleven. And then, of course, John says that um, the disciples, and, and uh, except for Thomas and Judas Iscariot, saw Jesus on Easter. And then some, Thomas saw him sometime later. So we can watch the story kind of evolve as time goes on. What happened at Jesus' tomb? Now, here's when we get into some places where it's kind of contradictory. And really, you can't argue from science. These things clearly, clearly contradict each other. Now, Paul never mentions an empty tomb, which is kind of weird because he really, really is preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And he claims to have been to Jerusalem many times after the resurrection. Never says, guys, I went to that tomb and it's empty. Just never brings it up. Uh, Mark says that when the women went to the tomb, one man in white told him Jesus had risen. Luke said two men in shining garments. You know, one doesn't equal two. Now, Matthew says that one angel of the Lord whose countenance was like lightning told him about it. Now, there's no way they can mistake an angel of the Lord whose countenance like, was like lightning with just one man. This was not a man. This was an angel with a glowing face with something that was unmistakably angelic. It was not a man. Uh, Matthew also embellished the story by adding the story about the dead saints. He also added the earthquake that we've already discussed. He said that Jesus appeared to the women before the women told the disciples. Now, according to John, two angels told Mary Magdalene that Jesus had been raised after she told G uh, John and Peter, and after John and Peter had actually been inside the tomb. And let me just go over that story in a little bit more detail. And as they, that is the women, went to tell the disciples, Behold, Jesus met them and said, Rejoice! And they came and held Him by the feet and worshipped Him. John says that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away. And when she sees the stone has been rolled away, she goes and tells Simon Peter, Peter and John run back over there and go inside the tomb before Mary Magdalene sees Jesus. Now, according to Matthew, by, that, by the time she told Peter and John, she'd already seen Jesus and grabbed him by the feet and been talking with him. There's no way that these stories line up. Either Mary saw Jesus before she told the disciples, or she saw Jesus after she told the disciples, because she could not have seen Jesus before she told the disciples, according to John, because she says they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid Him. Now, there, there's no way that she would have said that if she just grabbed onto His feet and talked to Him. These stories, there's no way that they're going to line up. The resurrection story to, continued to evolve in biblical times. Stephen saw Jesus, Saul and Paul and Ananias. Jesus spoke to Peter in a trance. They were all speaking in tongues. Jesus stood by Paul while he was in prison. There was a man caught up into the third heaven, according to the Apostle Paul. And of course, we have the whole book of Revelation. But now the resurrection story continued to evolve after biblical times. And one of the big ones, of course, is the Virgin Mary. Mary, according to Catholic and Eastern Orthodox tradition, had what's called the Assumption of Mary. That is, Mary was assumed she was ascended into heaven. And they actually celebrate this as a, um, uh, as a holiday in August, Assumption Day. Um, there's plenty of historical evidence for this, at least more than there is for the resurrection of Jesus, because we know where it happened. Um, 
We don't know where the resurrection of Jesus happened. They disagree about some, some key issues there. Uh, but we do know, uh, according to church tradition, that there is a house in Turkey where Mary allegedly uh, was taken up into heaven. Uh, now Mary is, and Jesus, of course, are not content to stay in heaven. Uh, we've got a very, some very nice, and I ordered this book, but it hasn't come in yet. We've got some very nice uh, ancient reports, eyewitness accounts, uh, people seeing Mary being taken up into heaven, just as we see reports of Jesus being seen by eyewitnesses uh, being raised from the dead and being taken up to heaven. Um, and ever since then there have been literally thousands of sightings of Jesus and Mary. If you Google, you know, vision of Jesus or vision of Mary, uh, you will get more than you want to know. Um, I'll, I'll just have a few examples here. Um, in Egypt, Two years ago, or a year and a half ago, hundreds if not thousands have been lining up every night at the Virgin Mary Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church in a Cairo neighborhood just off the Nile. Now this is a very specific vision. It's not just a blur. Look at this. Word quickly spread that the light took the shape of the Virgin Mary wearing a blue gown and standing in the sky between the church's two high crosses. So not only could they see Mary, but they knew she was making a fashion statement. They could see what she was wearing. So these visions are not nebulous kind of hallucinating things. They are very, very specific very often. In Conyers, Georgia, just east of Atlanta, the Virgin Mary has appeared 49 times, always very punctual on the 13th of each month, from 1990 to 1998. Now how do we know this is true? Well, there's a magic well there. And if you drink water from the magic well, you will be healed from your diseases. And of course there are eyewitness accounts of this too. Not to be outdone, Shelby County, Alabama, not Shelby County, Tennessee, but Shelby County, Alabama has had over 125 sightings of the Virgin Mary in 1988, 1989, 1994, 98, 99, 2001, 2003, 2004, and 2005. Every one of these, and I've, I've researched this on the web as much as I could, and I don't know <clears throat> if, um, maybe I missed a few. But everybody that I could find who saw Jesus or Mary was a Christian except for one. Muhammad saw Jesus at the location which Muslims believe is the Dome of the Rock. Jesus told him that Christians were wrong and that he, Muhammad, needed to start the Muslim religion. The evidence for this vision is at least as strong as the evidence we have for the Apostle Paul's vision because we don't know where the, Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul. It was just on the road to Damascus, and that's kind of a long road. But we have a very specific location here at the Dome of the Rock. And they even built, of course, a temple here, or, or a shrine to Muhammad to commemorate this and, and some other things about the Muslim religion. Now, possibly the most convincing evidence uh, of Jesus' resurrection that you can see today, that you can witness as an eyewitness today, is the holy fire at Jesus' tomb every year. Now this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre right here, originally built by Constantine's mother. Could not have been built by Constantine's wife because Constantine, being a good Christian, killed his wife. But it was built by his mother. He, he loved his mom. And so he sent her to Jerusalem to build this church. They told her where they thought the tomb was, and he built this church. The Protestants think it's a different place, but we know this is the right one because every year on the day before the Eastern Orthodox celebrate Christmas, the Orthodox priest will walk into the tomb of Jesus, and he, has, he gets searched to see if he has cigarette lighters or matches or anything on him. They have, have Jews search him to make sure that, you know, that there's no bias there. Then he walks into the tomb of Jesus, and he puts out 33 candles, I guess for 33 AD. And Jesus miraculously lights all of these candles. And he sees that. Now this is not some ignorant, you know, uh, superstitious fisherman from the first century. This is a very educated person who is a priest in the Orthodox Church that actually sees this happen. Now how do we know he's telling the truth? Well this fire has a unique characteristic. It, if you wave that fire at you, if you stick a body part on it for a long period of time, it will not burn you. And there are thousands of witnesses to this, and I have a few here. This is from Associated Press. Christianity's most holy shrine to celebrate the Orthodox Christian holy fire ritual. Christians believe I'm not making this up. Buried where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre now stands in Jerusalem. On the day before Easter, Orthodox and other Eastern Christians honor the belief 
that a holy fire appears spontaneously from Jesus' tomb is a message that he has not forgotten his followers. As the Greek Orthodox patriarch emerged with a flame, church bells pealed and the crowd outside started to cheer. Police say the ceremony went smoothly. Last week, worshipers came to blows over who had the right to worship inside the church on Palm Sunday. Sandy Cosell, the Associated Press. Now, I have video evidence that if you take this fire and put a body part in it, it's not going to burn you. I have several clips I'd like to show on that. Hello. There we go. There's no sound on these. See, it doesn't burn you. <laughs> See, it doesn't burn you. I think I've got what? No, I missed one. Here we go. Oh, well, I guess that one's not going to play for us. Anyway, um, see, we have eyewitness testimony from dedicated Christians that this fire will not burn you. And it comes from Jesus' tomb. Now, I can't help but point out that the evidence for this is much stronger than the alleged eyewitness evidence that we have for Jesus' resurrection. It happened in the same place. Paul says there were 500 witnesses. Associated Press said there were 10,000. 500 is small potatoes. You don't have to worry about who these people are. We can see them on video. We've got pictures of them. You can even hop on a plane and fly over to Jerusalem and go there yourself for Easter. Well, but they don't let you in while they're being lit. No, but I mean a priest wouldn't lie to us, would he? This is a, this is a priest of the Catholic Church. He wouldn't lie to us, would he? You get a second hand fire. But, but, but it still doesn't burn you. Does it? I mean, we've got video evidence here. Cameras don't lie, guys. I, uh, obviously, obviously, you're right. I mean, does Jesus, is there a reason why they won't let anybody but the priest in there when those candles get lit? Far be it from me to accuse a priest of doing anything inappropriate, okay? This has actually been going on for almost a thousand years. Well, isn't that the same thing they do with the supposed Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia? Only one person can go in and look at it? And they say, well, it's there. Well, it's didn't, didn't you see Raiders of the Lost Ark? You know what happens if you go in there. Um, obviously, obviously, from an atheist point of view, you know, none of this stuff happened. The, the point is, the point is that <clears throat> if you have people that want to believe something enough, large numbers of them are going to believe it, regardless of the facts, regardless of whether or not it makes any sense. And that went on in the first century, and it's still going on today. And you could go over there and interview these people, and you would find hundreds of people that really, really believed this stuff. So I agree with you. I, I totally agree with you. Um, no, it's just that report made it sound like they got the fire, actually got the fire out of the tomb themselves, but they don't. He just brings it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah he but, what what he does is there's there's this. Thing. It looks kind of like a kind of like a, a spare tire with 33 candles in it, and he goes in there, and somehow the candles get lit. Now he really does have Jews check him to make sure he doesn't have any matches with him. Okay, so you, I don't know, but um, uh, and and then he brings yeah. the fire out and hands it out to people, and they don't think it will burn them if they stick a body part in it for some period of time. So, um, but this, this is, this, I'm not making this up. I didn't, I didn't download this from like, you know, Betty Bowers or Landover Baptist or something. This, this is an actual Associated Press report. If you go to any search engine and type in Holy Fire Jerusalem, you will get way more information on this than you want to know. There's plenty, plenty of this stuff out there. Now, another characteristic of historical facts as opposed to myths, is that if you have a historically documented fact, the experts that really understand the evidence for that fact are going to tend towards agreement about major parts of that fact. Now, there may be little details to disagree on, uh, but there are going to be a widespread consensus on what really happened based on the evidence, unless new evidence comes up. Easter, the resurrection, on the other hand, Christian experts disagree very, very strongly about key facts such as where it happened, when it happened, 
or even if it happened. For example, Christian scholars disagree with each other about when the resurrection happened. Western Christians, that is Protestants and Catholics, celebrate Easter on days that are usually different from Eastern Orthodox and Coptic Christians. All of the red are different days that Christian Protestants and, and Christian Orthodox celebrate Easter on different days. The gray days are the same. But as you can see from 2002 to 2022, much more often than not, Christian, Eastern Christians and Western Christians do not agree on the date of the resurrection. Christian scholars disagree with each other about where the resurrection happened. Jesus' Protestant tomb is supposedly a place located outside of Jerusalem called the Garden Tomb. You been to that one? Yeah, yeah I've been to that one. Uh, I actually had a picture of it, but uh, it's not a very flattering picture of me in the, in, in the picture, so I didn't bring it. I'm, I'm kind of jet lagged. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I stood right there, I, and I will tell you the tomb was empty except for all the tourists coming in and out of it, <laughs> for a small fee, of course. Um, <clears throat> and Jesus' Catholic tomb, of course, we have the Holy Fire there. Yeah. Oh, you've been there too? Okay, well, you're one ahead of me then. Is, is that all the tombs that Jesus has had, or does anybody know about any more? Okay. Maybe he was raised twice, once for Protestants, once for Catholics, I don't know. But Christian experts disagree not only about where the re resurrection happened, they disagree about when it happened, and they also disagree about where it happened. But Christian scholars even disagree about, with each other about if the resurrection happened. Substantial portions of Christian leaders do not believe that the resurrection actually happened. Now, Current Thoughts and Trends magazine is not being published anymore, but Navigators is still around. In fact, I was active with Navigators when I was in, uh, in college. Uh, Navigators is a conservative Christian organization. They used to publish this magazine, and in 1999 they published this survey by a sociologist named Jeffrey Haddon. He got large percentages of ministers in these denominations, your more liberal denominations, to admit that they do not believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ ever happened. They believe it's a myth. It was figurative. It was a vision. It was whatever. Now this is in many cases a risky thing for a minister to do because your job depends on people believing that you believe this stuff. Um, but these people were in congregations or maybe denominational jobs or seminary or something where they didn't have to worry about that. And they were comfortable admitting that they did not believe in Jesus' resurrection. And these are people that Jesus signs their paycheck. And they still do not believe in the resurrection. Another survey, which was conducted by Barna Research, which is a Christian organization, in 2000 is a little bit more general, but it says that 33% of church leaders say they believe that Jesus was not physically resurrected. So we have a very large disagreement among Christians uh, as to whether or not Jesus was actually resurrected. So Christian experts cannot agree on when the resurrection happened. They cannot agree on where it re the resurrection happened. And a substantial percentage of them do not even believe that the resurrection actually happened. The last thing I'd like to talk about uh, is similarity of other ancient myths that predate Christianity. Osiris, Mithra, Krishna, Asclepius, all have very, very common parallels to the, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, the first time I saw that, I thought, well, that's really obviously Jesus. But actually, the archaeologists that have studied this inscription say, no, 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 that's not Jesus, that's Dionysus. So in the first century, Dionysus was dying for people's sins at the same time that Jesus was dying for people's sins. Now, I have a little scorecard here. I found a book on mythology and Christian traditions and, and folklore and stuff that um, <clears throat> tracks different characteristics of different ancient heroes. And I apologize for this being so small. It's on a spreadsheet. Uh, let me just read some of it. I've got Oedipus up at the top here. I've got various heroes. Oedipus, Theseus, Romulus, Heracles, Perseus, Jason, Bellerophon, Pelops, pardon me, Asclepius, Dionysus, and Jesus Christ. And let's just very briefly look at the similarities between these people. Uh, all of which are everybody believes are mythical. The only one that anybody believes in anymore is Jesus Christ. 
And all of these myths, by the way, predate Christianity. All of these myths are before the first century of, of the common era. They're a good hero. If you're going to be a good hero, your mother is royalty or descended from royalty, and your mother is a virgin before she, she conceives this hero. The father is a king, is descended from a king, or maybe he's a god, or maybe he's king of the gods like Jupiter or Zeus. <clears throat> father and mother may be related to each other. Uh, the circumstances of his conception are unusual. He's reputed to be the son of a male god, even if maybe he has a human father. Someone tries to kill him shortly after birth. That happened to just about everybody. Uh, then he's saved and protected from those who want to kill him, and he's reared by foster parents in a foreign country. We are told a lot about the circumstances of his birth, but little or nothing about him between infancy and adulthood. But upon reaching adulthood, he goes to his future kingdom. He is victorious against the king, giant, monster, dragon, serpent, wild beast, or some sort of a very badass adversary. He marries a princess or queen, which of course Jesus didn't do. He becomes a king. Uh, for a time he reigns uneventfully. He prescribes laws. After that he loses favor with the gods or the people. He's driven from his throne and city. He dies a death which is mysterious and is accompanied by supernatural events on the top of a hill very often. He's taken up into the sky and or heaven and or becomes a god. His children do not succeed him or he dies childless. His body is nowhere to be found, but nevertheless he has one or more holy sepulchers. And last but certainly not least, even though he lived a very famous life, he personally left no written records. Now Jesus gets a 24, but so does Romulus, the founder of the Roman Empire. And there's several very close runners up. Oedipus, Theseus, and Dionysus their myths all predate Jesus, and they all track with Jesus' myth very, very closely. So the Jesus story has many parallels with other stories in ancient mythology. And in fact, I know a lady who's, who's making her, writing her uh, dissertation on that. She's going to help me debate next Wednesday. <clears throat> Sorry. Um... Let me go over some, uh, some, some of the common arguments in favor of the resurrection. Uh, they're going to bring this up. This is by no means all of them. Um, the first one, and one that I don't have a slide on, is uh, that the stories of the resurrection and the sightings of Jesus after he died are so detailed, so nuanced, that nobody could possibly make those things up. This is probably the dumbest argument that I have encountered, but a lot, lot of people use it. Anybody that knows anything about ancient mythology knows that these things contain an enormous amount of detail. Here's the Aeneid, which is the story of the founding of Rome. I mean, this thing is huge. Look, small print, okay, hundreds of pages. And very, very, very large amount of detail. Here's the, uh, the Odyssey by Homer. You know, people back then, they didn't have TV and, you know, DVDs and video games and stuff. They had to have something to do. And so they would write these things. And sometimes people would even memorize them and they'd support themselves by just kind of going around and telling these stories. So uh, people are still studying these things as great literature that have a lot of nuance, that have an enormous amount of detail in them. Um, so anybody who makes the claim that the resurrection and the, the sightings of, of Jesus or the travels of the Apostle Paul or whatever are so detailed that somebody couldn't make it up just doesn't know anything about ancient literature because this stuff is, is all over the place. By no means are the Odyssey, the Iliad, and the, and the Aeneid unusual. <clears throat> Another one is if Jesus was resurrected, what happened to his body? Uh, this is one of those kind of leading questions that they don't tell you about their assumptions. It's sort of like the, the riddle, what, how do you pronounce the name of the capital of Kentucky? Do you pronounce it Louisville, Louisville, or Louisville? Who knows? How do you pronounce the name of the capital of Kentucky? Louisville. Frankfurt. <laughs> the capital of Kentucky is Frankfurt. There's an inherent misleading in this that they assume that the, there was a body and that the Gospels are historically accurate. Obviously, if the Gospels were historically accurate, the presence or absence of a body is a very big issue. But 
if there's no body, uh, if they were taken up into heaven like Romulus or Heracles or Asclepius, you don't have to worry about a body. Um, if it's a complete myth, you don't have to worry about a body. If it's largely mythical, you probably don't have to worry about a body either. I was wondering, in following that logic, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy Hoppe could be Christ. They didn't find his body either. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anybody here pray to Jimmy Hoffa? Okay. Um, next one is, why didn't the Jews just dig up Jesus' body and show it to everyone to disprove the resurrection? Um, again, this kind of assumes that the Gospels are largely historically accurate. Um, but there's some, uh, this kind of, I don't know if it shows ignorance, but, you know, we embalm bodies these days. And so, you know, Joseph Stalin's body is supposedly still sitting in the Kremlin somewhere, you know, 100 years later or I guess 60 years later, and they, people can still see it. Um, but ancient bodies weren't like that. Uh, I want to uh, uh, announce a gross alert. We've got dead bodies in these videos, so I will warn you before I show you the dead bodies. But um, <clears throat> if you've if you got a weak stomach, then uh, you can close your eyes. Um, could the Jews or Romans have disproved the resurrection by producing the body of Jesus? You have to ask yourself when they would have really wanted to do this. The disciples, the Bible says, were in hiding after the crucifixion and even after the resurrection of Jesus. They were in a room and the doors were shut when Jesus came to them. They went back to Galilee and they were fishing. So the Jews had no reason, the Romans had no reason to try to disprove the resurrection because basically nothing was going on until Pentecost. Now, Pentecost occurred approximately 50 days, that's why they get the word penta, 50 days after the resurrection was believed to have occurred. What is an unembalmed human body going to look like if you bury it after 50 days? Well, it depends on the temperature, whether it's exposed or buried and so forth. Now, an exposed body, if they just dumped it out, it would have been eaten by scavengers and would be skeletonized within just a few days. So that's not even an issue. Now, um, they did have, uh, and here's where we have the gross alert. Gross alert, dead bodies, okay. Um, uh, sorry, one more slide before we do the gross alert. Um, Jerusalem is the same latitude as Montgomery, Alabama. Now remember, Easter occurred March or April. Pentecost occurred May, June, maybe early July. Uh, gets pretty hot in Montgomery, but now Jerusalem is higher in altitude than Montgomery is. And so its climate really is more similar to Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, there is a, a, what they call a body farm in Knoxville, Tennessee, where they study dead bodies. They'll take them in and lay them out in the woods or they'll bury them shallowly or they'll cover them up with plastic or whatever. People actually will their bodies to the body farm. And you, if you study forensics at University of Tennessee in Knoxville, you can go to the body farm and help them do whatever kind of research that they do. So uh, Jerusalem and Knoxville, the temperatures track very closely according to weather.com. And in fact, uh, Jerusalem is on the average warmer than Knoxville by about a degree. So, you know, May, April, May, June, you know, it gets pretty warm in Knoxville. So, even if you're just in a shallow grave. Now, um, they didn't give criminals a really nice burial after they crucified them. Okay, they buried them in a mass grave. And this next picture is disgusting and it's from Haiti. Uh, but this is the way that they bury people in a mass grave. Okay, they dig a hole, they dump all the bodies in it, and the way, reason this is forensically significant is that bodies interact with each other when you bury them in a mass grave. Uh, the body fluids get shared and bacteria and stuff, and it's, it's really gross. Um, so they were just thrown in a mass grave and, and left to rot and hopefully forgotten. So if they had dug somebody up out of a mass grave like that, what would they have looked like 50 or more days after being buried. Well, something like this, okay? Completely unrecognizable. They would have rotted so much, all the body fluids would be gone, it would be skeletonized, uh, parasites and bacteria would have eaten things. If they had dug up Jesus, say two months, two and a half months after the crucifixion, his body would have looked very much like that, okay? So the idea that they could just dig up the body and disprove the resurrection is just bogus. It doesn't fit the facts. Another argument that they'll use. Well, yes. I was say, uh, historically, 
I've always been taught, thought, that he wasn't actually buried in the ground. That he was in a stone got tomb. Got tomb. Yeah. Well, but the tomb's empty. So you have to, you have to ask yourself, what would they have done with the body? And, and uh, actually, uh, uh, it depends on the temperature of the tomb. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the, I mean, if they buried somebody in a cave around here, it'd be about 58 degrees. Yeah. Um, now, the, the, the tomb in Jerusalem, I've been in there, and it's like this deep. So it would be much more subject to outside temperatures. But the, the tomb was empty. Something happened to the body. And so they, they have to come up with some sort of an explanation. Did the, 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 the disciples steal it? Well, no, they had no reason to. Um, did, the, did the Jews or the Romans take it and just dump it somewhere because they didn't want a lot of trouble? And if so, then, you know, would they have dug it up? So um, the, the, the problem, uh, this, you hear a lot among Christians about what they call presuppositional apologetics, which is you, if you presuppose the Bible is true and go around looking for evidence that it's true, then you're going to be convinced that it's true. Conversely, they think that we presuppose that it's false, and so we're going to come to the conclusion that it's false, and the facts don't really matter. Well, I was a Christian that believed that the Bible was true. That was my presupposition until I really studied it, and then came, I came to the conclusion that it was false, that it was a myth. So um, that doesn't work for me. Um, but anyway, the, the issue is the empty tomb. How do you explain the empty tomb if, if Jesus wasn't resurrected? Um, another question that very often comes up is, well, Josephus mentioned Jesus and actually reported on his resurrection. And Jesus is a very uh, well-respected, uh, by, by all scholars, uh, historian of Jewish culture in the time of the first century. And here's his entire statement. And I'm not going to, to read the whole thing to you. You can read it. But this is Josephus' whole book. This is how much space is devoted to Jesus uh, in the book. Now, I want you to notice that Josephus, who was a Jew, claimed that he appeared to them alive on the third day and that he was the Messiah. Now, just how long would Josephus have stayed Jewish if he really believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah? Okay, this, is, this statement is a fraud. Uh, this is a later, interp oops, later interpolation a later um, addition to the, the books of Josephus. If you look at, at Josephus and look at, for example, how much time he spends talking about Herod, you just got pay, all the pink pages of Herod, you just got page after page after page on Herod the Great that everybody hated. Now, why would Josephus have devoted that much time to somebody that everybody hated and only one little paragraph to the Messiah? Come on. It's just not historically credible. It is a fraud. And anybody who takes the time to actually pick up the book and read it, it will be very, very obvious to them that it's a fraud. The Shroud of Turin. Uh, a lot of people uh, will bring this up. It's really pretty much been uh, discredited. This is the way the shroud actually looks. And this came off of Wikipedia. Now, if you take this image and, and up the contrast on it and take the negative of the image, this is what it looks like. And they were like, oh, my gosh, this is, this is Jesus, you know. Uh, there's several problems with the Shroud of Turin. Uh, there is no historical record. Uh, everybody know what the Shroud of Turin is? This is a, a, allegedly what they wrapped around Jesus' body while he was buried, uh, um, burial shroud. There's no historical record of its existence before the 1300s. It's been carbon-14 dated to the 1300s. The Catholic Church has never claimed that it is authentic. And you can actually prove that the Shroud of Turin is bogus if you'll just take yourself a, a, any cloth, a towel or whatever, and wrap it around yourself, maybe put some lipstick or something on there, and, and then take it off. And the image will be smeared. You will not get a projected image like this. You will get a smeared image that my ears will be this wide. My cheeks will be smeared out. It's a bit like one of these panoramic dental x-rays that they take on you, where your whole face is smeared out to where it's like this, because you're taking a three-dimensional object and taking the surface of it and trying to spread it out. So if they had wrapped a body in a shroud or any piece of cloth and then unwrapped it, 
it would not have looked like this. It would have been all smeared all over. And I was thinking about asking for volunteers of the audience and, you know, putting some makeup on your face or something, but I thought I'd never get anybody to volunteer to do that, so I didn't do it. But um, anyway, it just doesn't even fit from a geometrical point of view. You would not get this kind of image on somebody if you wrapped a cloth around them and then something happened. Aside from the fact that it's been carbon dated and that there's absolutely no historical evidence for it being anywhere near as old as, as people say it is. Another argument that you hear is that there are more and better ancient manuscripts of the Bible than any other ancient document. Uh, the, there's several problems with this. First of all, a thousand copies or a hundred thousand copies of a myth is still a myth. You know, you can take the Book of Mormon and try, trace it back to just a few years from when Joseph Smith got it. We've got copies that are that old. We don't have anything anywhere near that good for the Bible. But Christians, the vast majority of them, believe that the Book of Mormon is a myth. And they're right. But they apply a different standard to the Bible. But it's actually worse than that because many ancient books that don't exist anymore were destroyed by Christians who actually destroyed them. Uh, when Theodosius commanded the burning of the Serapium, the, the Library of Alexandria, when Theodosius demanded the closing of all of the universities in the Roman Empire in 391 AD, um, many, many ancient books, Jewish, pagan, uh, scientific books were burned by Christians, and in many cases they burned the owners too. Uh, another um, argument that they will use is that the risk of believing in Jesus' resurrection is small, but the risk of not believing is enormous. If you believe in the resurrection, what's it going to cost you? No big deal. But if you don't believe in the resurrection, you will spend eternity in hell. Now, is it really worth taking that chance? This is a variation on something called Pascal's Wager, which if you believe in God, you know, and God really exists, that's, then you get rewarded. If you believe in God and God doesn't exist, then nobody's going to punish you. The problem with that is, um, <clears throat> the problem with that is that Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, and so forth are all mutually, mutually exclusive. Which one am I going to believe in? You can't believe in all of them. You can't devote your life to all of them. Second of all, the cost of believing the resurrection is huge. Christian, Christianity wants your time, talent, and treasure. The church wants to dominate every detail of your life. So the cost of believing in the resurrection is not small. They're saying, well, you know, I don't know if God exists or not, but I'm going to kind of, you know, kiss the divine posterior here just in case something goes wrong and, you know, and, and I wind up, you know, facing God. God, if He exists, He's wise enough to value the honest questioning of a sincere skeptic much more than the cynic who's trying to, to, to manipulate and play games with God. So this Pascal's Wager thing just doesn't work. I'd like to close out with a statement from Thomas Jefferson where he looked forward to the day when the mystical generation of Jesus will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Um, now, Christians, of course, have, not, have chosen not to engage Thomas Jefferson in debate on this. They have simply removed him from the public school curriculum in Texas. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I do have a little bit of time for a brief Q&A. We're supposed to be out here by four, is that right? Yes. Okay, anybody else have the room at four? Does anybody know? Okay. Um, as, as you're leaving, I have two books that I have for sale, uh, 100 False Bible Prophecies and 100 Bible Math Mistakes. Uh, I publish these myself through my own label, Freethinkers Books. Um, if you buy these books, one or more of these books today, 100% of your purchase price will go to benefit the, the Memphis Free Thought uh, Alliance. Um, I will not be getting any, I'm not even recovering my costs on this, so if you buy a $10 book, $10 go, will go to Memphis Free Thought Alliance. So, uh, and you don't have to pay shipping and handling. If you miss this opportunity, you have to buy them on Amazon, and you have to pay shipping and handling.